fiction. It's science fiction. Horror. Fantasy. Crime. LGBT. Thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. Ooh, welcome back into the house of mystery. Of course, I'm Mel Warren, and we've got Joe Goldberg in the house, so it's really scary. Scary. I'm in the house a little bit because, because I'm still glowing from my post BoucherCon uh, attendance. BoucherCon, that's the one I avoid all the time, and you go every year. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, it's just it's because um, there is a, there is things, but about it, but I would go except for it's too much. It's, it's, it's big. A, there's too many people, and and it get, it feels like the drive-through. It seems like you get to say hi to a lot of people, but it's it's not as much calm period like i can't i like to have you know more conversations and stuff and it seems like it's so rushed that's all yeah what's well, up to you it's up to you to decide how many panels you want to go to and it's a it's a networking fest and you get a chance to meet hero authors and yeah other people have helped you along the way so that's i well, did who, my panel and I, who else is there to meet other than me you weren't there i know and so why would there were some of the people <laughs> who were when we went to seattle yeah who were there i, I got a chance to say hello to that was nice new people but it was good overall. And I guess it seems like the backlash was mainly about the books not being sold oh, for a lot yeah. of the, the writers and that. And that we'll let you know. that go. Yeah. Yeah, it seems to be something I see a lot. A lot of people are posting now about it, so that's why I say that. And yeah, There were some that's... good panels. And it, and it was a really good cross-section of different genres, which is interesting. But they had, you know, the biggest of the bigs there, Coben and Thor and Merrill and Heron and just – Kept going on. And you. And you. (laughs) I I just kept walking up to these guys and going, I'm fan geeking on you. I keep your lights on. Please, (laughs) please uh, throw me some magic fairy pixie dust on me so I can be like you type of type of. Did it work? No. Who knows? But I was was pretty embarrassing kind of guy. Just kind of groveling. Well, and we've got a uh, an author like that. We've got somebody to grovel to. Yeah, Steve Hamilton. So, welcome, Steve. Thank you so much. No groveling, please. Uh, seriously, I'm I'm not the guy to grovel to because I don't know what why you would even think of that. But Steve, did you go? I, I did not go to BouchCon this year. I've been many many times. I, I I agree with you. It's 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 so much in just a couple days. It's like drinking from a fire hose, you know, in terms of people that you see just for a second. And uh, but and it's not even really. I mean, it's not even about the panels, really. It's about just hanging out at the bar afterwards for like, and and just and just reconnecting with all these cool people. That's 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 the game, right? It really is. A lot of drinking going on. A lot, yeah. There's a if you're by Joe, there has to be. Hey, I was there. My son got engaged while we were there in Nashville, so I spent a lot of my time. Oh, that's cool. Doing that's family cool. things. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I gave up my professional career for my family. Yeah. Again. <laughs> yeah, really. Let's get to Steve. Go on. Steve. Yeah, yeah. So, Steve, Steve, um, or how did you get into writing? First of all, because you've never been on this show before, and I always like to see where I have not. And I, I've uh, and I'm 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 so happy to be here. First of all, thank you so much. Um, I'm out I'm on tour with the new book, and um, when I got the chance to, when when they told me I could do this, it was I was very excited because uh, this is this is a great program. You and you guys are great, and I, I'm I can't believe I finally get to talk to you guys. Oh, there you go. See, now he's graveling at you, Joe. I told you. Everybody. Thanks for joining. Have a nice day, everybody. That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, I mean, where did it start for you? Are you, are, did you, are you one of those kids that wrote in school type thing and all the way through and you've always been a writer or is it something I can? It's, 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 it's what I always wanted to do since I was a kid. Growing up, as I'm sure pretty much all of us have, have just, just loving to read. You know, reading books and, this, and I, I gravitated towards mystery and dark fiction and and thrillers and um you know if, if you go back in a time machine uh to when i'm you know eight or nine years old and you ask me what i want to be when i grow up this is pretty much exactly it so i'm, I'm i know i'm pretty lucky uh, but i knew you know when i graduated from college it's not like i got to just go do that so it, it took a while for me to get there but i did have that promise i sort of made to myself and the only reason I'm here is because I just didn't forget that promise, and I finally made it happen. Yeah, for me, it was just kind of a secondary thing. I wanted to be a dancer and stripper, and and I didn't make it, so I ended up being a writer. An, an exotic thing. No, yeah, yeah, exactly. I can see that. Yeah. And, and, I can see that. No, I can see that. And, and, no, you don't want to see it, believe me. No. <laughs> don't want to see it. <laughs> and so I ended up being a writer. So it's just uh, I, I would imagine when you were doing 
earlier days in writing, because a lot of writers say this, they have something, they have a lot of manuscripts that they've put um, in the drawer, so to speak, you know, and right. it'll never see the light of day and stuff. I, I, wonder, I always wonder when was that particular time that you knew that one of your manuscripts was worth publishing? Like, was there a turning point there? You know, there was there. There used to be this thing that Sam Martin's did uh, back in the day. It was called the Best First Private Eye Novel, and it was like a contest. You know, always loving Private Eyes uh, and Private Eye fiction, like I did. It's like you know, this this is. I, I just saw that, and it's like this would be a great chance just to just to sort of try a Private Eye novel. I tried to write a Private Eye novel for that contest, and but the twist is is that I failed so completely and utterly to write a private eye novel because and this you know i thought i knew what a private eye novel was i thought you had to have your guy in an office you know and the, and the client you know comes to the you know i mean i i'm laying out the whole scene and we've all seen it and there's nothing wrong with that by the way you you can still do a great book that way but i had all this time off from work you know i was working with, i was working for ibm back then and it's like okay i'm gonna write i'm gonna write this private eye novel, I got two weeks off, I'm going to write every day, I'm going to get a, you know, I'm going to write, I'm, it's going to be half done by the time I go back to work. And in all that time, I wrote exactly two words, I swear to God, I wrote two words, and they were chapter one, because I just couldn't do it. It's like this guy, I, I, I had a guy sitting in an office, and I just didn't know who'd walk through that door, and I just, and it's like every day I just stalled, and I just, I, I just felt like such a failure. You know, that was my glorious start as a private eye writer, it was just absolutely failing so miserably and then going back to work and being in such a bad mood and i went home that one i remember that night i went home it's like okay i'm gonna just write something else so something totally different just 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 because i want to write something and that's how i started writing about alex mcknight well um, that's interesting because my panel was on like rejection and, and yeah and, uh, yeah that type of stuff and acceptance so you I, you used the word promise. I wrote that down. You, you promised yourself you're going to do that. Yeah. Here you go. You go through the rejection of the private eye thing, and you write two words, and you, you go off and write right. the next. Were you afraid to break your promise? In my case, it, the rejection was was it was sort of a self rejection in that I you know it's not like I wrote something I thought it was good and somebody said no this is crap. It's like I thought I could write it, and then I totally failed to even write it to even get it off the ground. So it, it was just such a failure, uh, you know, that, that I had to sort of accept. And then I had to go past that. And I had to say, okay, maybe there's something on the other side of it. And it was real. And it was really, you know, it's, it's strange to think of this sort of this sense of failure as being the thing that you start with. But that's what I, that's what Alex started with. It's like, I'm going to write about somebody who feels like I do. Who just, you know, and that's how I ended up writing about an ex-cop who's all alone in this cabin, you know, so far away from everything in the most f forlorn place I could think of, which is a real town called Paradise, Michigan, up, up in the Upper Peninsula. And I just started, I just followed that mood and that idea. It's like, why is he a failure? What did he fail at? And why is he still, you know, just up here, not able to, get to, to deal with it? And, and that's where that story came from. Uh, the, 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 the first books were about my ex cop, um, Alex McKnight from, from Detroit, who goes up to Paradise, Michigan. And that was, the first book was, was a cold day in paradise. Uh, is there a particular reason why you chose him to be, uh, a cop, ex cop? I just thought, you know, this, it just felt like that's, that's a job that has a consequence that if you do make a mistake as a cop, or if you do, or if you do fail as a cop, um, it's usually going to be something pretty serious, you know, and that, that's just sort of where I began with him. And that's, you know, and, and as the book went on, it, it sort of, he, he needed to be a cop so that he could become, a, he could sort of get tricked into becoming a private eye because to become a private eye in Michigan, you have to have been a cop essentially. And so we were, really, he was just sort of, that's what I, that's what he needed to be for that story. And then I just followed it from there. You created the character. And you created later on. You created Nick Mason. Yeah, and then and then Nick was yes, right. Nick Nick came later. Yeah. So was there? Who, what came first? The sense I feel, I sense and feel this sort of failure, overcoming yeah. that type of uh, existence and coming and making it through, or did the character come first? It was the, it was the feeling that came through because the character was the character came with the feeling because I because I didn't even know that's where I was going. Again, I, I thought I, I needed to write a private eye. And, you know, that was my goal because I love private eye books and I wanted to write one. And it was only when I failed and gave up that I 
that Alex was on the other side, but it was the, it was that feeling of failure that sort of brought me to him, if if that makes any sense. And, and that became the theme, in some sense, of the book. That became the theme of that first book, exactly. Right. When when you were writing that character, you did eleven books in that series. Uh, yeah. Did you, did you did you have it kind of planned out where you were going to go from the start? I certainly did not. No, not at all. I it's like I was just trying to write that first book and make it something that was interesting and different. And um, and it wasn't until I until I finished that I even thought about writing another one. And then every book since then has just been okay. What could ha- you know? What's what's an interesting thing that could happen next? And I just uh, I just follow it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know where the book's going to go when I start it. Those books, let alone you know how it would fit into a larger you know. 10, 11 book arc. How did you keep the continuity? How did you keep it so that you remember things from book one into book 10, let's say? You know, it's kind of funny you say that. There's actually, there's, there's, there's one person named, named Jan who, who knows this character even better than I do, it feels like. So I've, you know, if it's been a little while since I've, you know, if I take a break and write about something else or, or a different character, I'll, I'll sometimes call up Jan and say, how many years did he play minor league baseball again? <laughs> oh, yeah, four, oh, yeah, thank you. Okay, that's right. And then it'll sort of come back to me. You know? Well, you created a new character for the new series. Uh, where did he come from? What, is, what's the relationship? Is there a relationship between Nick and Alex? or is it just? Yeah, no, Nick, he's a very, that's a good question. He's a very different character. I mean, Alex is, Alex is an ex-cop, um, you know, trying to be sort of left alone, but always kind of wanting to do the do the right thing when it, when it comes to it um nick you know it's it's very easy to root for alex and then you know I, then I, I wrote a book called called the lock artist with with a young safe cracker so that was really like my first criminal character but it wasn't he didn't have it wasn't a choice for him so it's not so you could you could still root for michael pretty easily for nick mason it's like as a writer you you you, you want to challenge yourself and nick was the first just straight up i'm going to write about a straight up criminal this, this guy, he's 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 in Chicago. He grew up on the South Side. He he learned how to steal cars. He you know he learned how to do these heists and things. And when he ends up in prison in that first book, which was a second life of Nick Mason, he has to make he makes this deal with somebody that you know because because he wants to get out. He wants to get back with his with his wife and his and his daughter. And he makes this deal that that gets him out of prison. But whenever the phone rings, he has to answer it and then go do whatever he is told. That's the premise of, of that whole first book, all the things that he has to do. And then um, the second book was called Exit Strategy, and, and, and the title kind of gives away what the mindset was. It's just it's just too much, and he's trying to get out of it. And at the end of that book, for, for like one moment, he thinks he might have won his freedom. But on the very last page, he finds out that he's essentially just traded one master for another, and he's on a plane to Jakarta of all places, on the last page of that book. And on the first page of this new one, an honorable assassin, he, he, he gets off that plane. So they're really connected. Yeah, no, no they absolutely, it, it totally, it's like literally just a plane ride is the only thing that happens between the end of that book and the beginning of this one. But, you know, it's it's a whole different world for him because he doesn't know anything about this place. Uh, this, this kid from Chicago now is on the other side of the world. He has a new organization that he's working for. And he's got to go out and find somebody, and he has to kill him. And this is, you know, this is uh, what he has to do. And he tries to do it, and he totally fails. And then he fails again. And this, so it's it's really a different kind of book. It's the first time I've really written like an international, you know, thriller kind of book. So it was a whole new new thing. But but it was it was kind of a blast too. Well, with this character Nick Mason, and even the first one, is it like a relationship with these characters? Do you hear them, see them? It's just like watching a movie, or how? What's your experience with your characters? Yeah, that's 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 a good question. How how you sort of relate to your to your own character? Um, by the time I got to Nick, I I had done so many other books with with Alex, and I sort of learned a little bit more how I was doing. So I I actually sort of got to put put it together a little bit more first. You know, it's like with Alex, I I never had an outline. I never had anything more than a feeling. And you know, with Nick, I was just really able to just kind of put this guy together put his life together and it did and and you're right it did kind of feel a little bit like a movie sense and this time around you know because that's that's just you know when you've been doing this for a little while um i think you, i think you start to think that way a, a little bit more creating the dialogue with someone like this who's yeah. been in prison for five years maximum security and stuff like that how do you get into that mind how do you get into the headset where you can do a dialogue from a character like that 
I mean, that's that's a that's something you really have to be careful with because it's so easy to, to make like a cartoon version of that. Um, so you have to. I mean, I've I've been in prisons before, and I've and I've talked to people who are doing lifetime sentences. You know, I'm, I'm I, I think I'm pretty good at just really listening to people and sort of getting the rhythm and getting what they sound like. And and the one thing that that you sort of have in common, I think, with with the with the people that I've talked to is that. They have a very careful way of talking. You know what I mean? It's, it's like words. Words have a lot of importance when you're in that kind of environment. So they're so they're used to talking very very clearly. If if, if that makes sense, because you know you, you don't want to be misinterpreted in that environment. So that was the thing that really struck me talking to somebody. It's like they they really speak carefully and clearly because they have to. You know, and and they're and they're not acting like tough guys because that's just stupid. Yeah, I've interviewed uh, killers, serial killers. Yeah, I do yeah. a lot of that, and and it's true. That's the biggest thing I notice, and I, I want to tell people that they're not like Hannibal Lecter. They're not. This, no, it's real. You know, they're confident, they're very direct, and they say what they mean and all that sort of stuff. But they're not. It's not like the real tough guy kicking everything around and scaring you when you walk in. No, no, that 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 just doesn't work. And if if they go in that way, they soon find out that's not the way to do it. Yeah. Well, you changed from Chicago, which I live outside of. No, oh, okay. Jakarta, area, <laughs> yes. areas of the world I've been. I know you've been asked this question, but it is. Yeah. The question's two pieces. Is set, how important is the setting? And two, just in general, uh, Jakarta ain't Chicago. I mean, maybe a bit Jakarta is not Chicago. I mean, that was the point of um, sending him to a place like that. Is like, um, you know, for the first two books, he is in Chicago. He is in the place that he grew up and knows better than anybody. Even though he's on the north side, so it's kind of like a strange thing for him to grow yeah. up on the south side. Yeah, that's uh, a different world. So, so it, yeah, it's a, it is, and and it's fun. And, and I actually got to use that because there's this one point where he goes, for, he takes the he takes the boat from Jakarta across the Straits to Singapore, which is again, you know, this is ten thousand miles away from Chicago. But there's this moment when when it's like, man, this this feels just like. Going from the south side to the north side, like going to going to a Cubs game, you know, it's just a whole different world up here, you know. And you know, that's that's the, that's the thing that that struck him when he's on that boat. It's like it's like he realizes soon after he gets there that that Indonesia sort of feels a little bit more like home to him than than Singapore, which of course, you know, from what we know of Singapore, it's a whole you know big, you know, it's like Oz, you know. Like Miami, and they drive on the wrong side of the road. It's kind of yeah, yeah, say. exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's like that's that's like the one thing that's in common across the world is that there's always the wrong side of the tracks, you know. And and he ends up on the wrong side of the tracks, and he kind of feels a little bit at home there, even though you know as soon as he gets off the plane, I mean, he's in this place where they don't speak any English, and it's you know it's just a different world for him. And and that was that was intentional to make him feel as disoriented and as far from home as possible. Because that, that's a big part of the challenge in, in this book for him. Did Nick develop for, let's say, I'll say for a reason. Yeah. Is he enter pure entertainment? Is he there to say something to the reader? What is Nick to the reader? I, I, I just wanted Nick to be somebody. I was ready to write about a character who's a lot harder, a lot tougher than anybody I'd, I'd done before. But at the same time, I wanted you to see the humanity in him. And I wanted you... To actually be able to relate to him a little bit, at least, and 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 to root for him. I mean, that was the challenge. It's like it's like this, this guy chose this life, and he ends up in prison, and and he gets out, and he's got to do all these horrible things, but he's doing it to protect his daughter. You know, that's the one thing I can relate to as you know, as as a father, and asking myself, what would I do to protect my daughter? Pretty much, you know, pretty much anything. And that's the one thing. That I, that's one, maybe the only thing that I have in common with Nick, you know, and that's but that's the thing that drives him. There's an important thread in this book where he actually finds a girl on the street who's like selling sunglasses, and he tries to give her money, and that gets her in trouble. And so for the rest of the book, he's he's looking for this girl who reminds him of his daughter, just so he can help her. Without that thread, it, I don't think this book would have worked because I need because he needs. Because you need to see that as a reader, that the, that he still has this humanity that he's trying to hold on to. Did that thread, did you, was it planned or did it grow organically as you're writing along? I knew some, he needed something like that. Because in the other books, you know, he his his family is right there. I mean, they're not a big part of his life because they've, you know, his his ex-wife has made that choice, as, 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 as heartbreaking as that is. 
But now they're 10,000 miles away. So it's like I needed that one thing to ground him. And it was and I knew early on as he's walking through this big city that he just had to find a girl that reminded him of, of, of his daughter. It was just the thing that sort of had to happen. I want to ask about the secondary characters because we can talk about Nick and Alex, but we mentioned his wife yeah. and his daughter and the girl on the street. Yeah. Well, tell, tell me something about the secondary characters and how they came about, their their importance, what, why they were there. In this book, that you know, this is the first time that he's that he's working with a team of people. And when he gets off the when he gets off the plane, you know, he doesn't know what to expect, and he's in, he's immediately thrust into this into this uh, team situation. And it's kind of an example. I mean, we've all had bad jobs. Where we're working with people that we can't trust, you know, we've all been there. Imagine if your life depended on it. In in the very first book, Nick's got all these rules that he lives by, and rule number one is never work with strangers, because strangers either put you in prison or or they put you in the ground. So imagine having that as your rule number one, and you get off the plane, and all of a sudden you've got this team of people that you've never met before, and you have to work with them to try to go kill somebody. And so you know, those are the people. Those are the first secondary characters that show up in this book and and one of them uh luna is 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 the one person that's going to become the most important to him because she's the she's the one person who is better at this than he is and she's the one who recognizes that he's trying to hold on to that piece of himself and not become a you know just a just a just an assassin machine and she's the one who has to tell him you know that, that there's no such thing as an honorable assassin that's 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 where this that's where the title of the book comes from. Is 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 her is her trying to convince him that he can't do that he can't be that because it doesn't exist. Um, and that's that's one of the tensions that runs runs through the whole book. You know, when you live through a character, when you're writing, let's say Nick Mason, and it takes you the year or two, or however long it takes you to write, and you and you're kind of living through that character and going through all the events and writing and stuff. Do you find that this sort of changes you in any way? I mean, it kind of does. Yeah. I mean, you. You can't help but start to think a little bit like like your characters, which is which can be a little scary. I mean, there was I did have one book where I sort of wrote it a little bit from the viewpoint of a serial killer, and and it was not a fun thing to do. It really isn't. It's it's, it's not a, a headspace that that you want to be in. You, you don't want to think that way, even though you know it's fiction. You're just doing it for a book. It's not something I'd, I would ever do again. You know, I I just don't like thinking about thinking through the eyes of somebody who's that evil and that sort of that sort of soulless. For someone like Nick, who's not evil, who who does have soul and does have humanity, it's it it still does make you think a little bit different because he is he's such a direct and practical person, and he just tries to get stuff done. It is kind of funny how you know after you've been writing all day, I do find myself sometimes you know just sort of approaching my own life with a, with a little bit more directness. Because I was sort of thinking in, in Nick's head all day long. Well, it's not like uh, you're waking up with a shovel by the bed or anything weird, right? So, <laughs> it's a horse head. Not yeah. yet. <laughs> not as yet. So this, not yet, no. Not yet. But, but, but yeah. Yeah. I, would, I, would, I wouldn't rule it out, but not yet. Is there are things that you won't write. Are there things that you say, you know what, this is too dark, I don't want to go there, my readers are going to hate this, I have fans, is there some stuff that you let out? I think all writers have things, you know, and, and they and they have sort of jokey names, you know, Kid Jep and Pet Jep, you know, Pet Pet Jeopardy and Kid Jeopardy. Um, I would have a real hard time writing about something really bad happening to a child. I, I just don't think I could go there, um, or or even like a dog. I mean, we're talking about how much I love dogs. I don't think I could ever have a really bad scene where a dog is is hurt or killed or something. It's just something I just wouldn't. I just want to. Because that, because that means you got to think about it and work it out and live on that page and come back to it. I just, I just wouldn't want to do it, you know. Yeah, there's something about that, you know. It seems there's a type of innocence that you are not just hurting, but you're taking advantage of. And there's something about that that, as I have gotten older, I don't like it. Yeah, you're using that as sort of cheap effect. Yeah, it's like this is this is a cheap thrill. I can I can sort of put a shiver down the reader's spine by by hurting a dog or something. It's like you know, it's like. If that's what you had to use to, to, to get a rise out of somebody, you know, I think you I think you could have done something else. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't seem, yeah, and that. Uh, well, what about the violence, and what about the action in there? Um, are you conscious of how you write it then? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's funny that you say that because even as I'm talking about what I won't do, I'm, I'm realizing I have done a lot of pretty violent stuff. But and it's like somehow I'm I'm able to do it because like I mean in in this book the the guy that he's hunting down is not a good guy 
You know, he is he is a man, very powerful man who invests in terrorism sort of as a as a commodity, as as an investment, as something that he can put money into and, and get a return on. And the reason why Nick is sent to hunt this guy down isn't because the organization he works for has like a moral problem with it. It's because he's just bad for business. But it's a little bonus for Nick that he doesn't that it's like, OK, this guy does really bad things or, or makes really bad things happen. It makes it just a little bit easier for him to go after him. And one of the other characters in this book happens to be uh, an Interpol agent who was assigned to Indonesia from from France, and he had his own background with this with this guy with with the with the Paris bombings that he sort of blames him for. So he has his own reason to be to be hunting the same guy. And that's one of the other interesting threads in this book is that they sort of. They're both going after the same person, but obviously for very different reasons and for in very different ways. And they, they end up sort of sort of tangling up a little bit. You know, your characters, this is probably easier for your first character, Alec McKnight, because you had 11 books. But are you kind of happy with where that character went and how they turn out? And that's even like cause even the character you're doing now, Nick Mason. Do you really have control over that or does it just sort of happens and you're kind of not sure and then it ends up a certain way? I think with Nick, as I set out to write about Nick, as is sort of a tight thriller kind of a book. I think I had a much better idea, sort of what he would be and where he'd end up. Maybe just being a being a more mature writer, I was able to do that. With Alex, from the beginning, it's just a matter of finding out where he goes next, and it's been a trip. I mean, that's it's been a trip just 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 to go wherever he goes and to find out some of the things that happened. I mean, there there have been things that happened in that book that were terrible that I never that I really didn't see coming, which which sounds kind of strange. But I mean I, I was there was one book where something so bad happens and I and I went out on tour with that book and a couple of people said to me, How could you do that? How could you let that happen? And my answer, my my honest, sincere answer was I didn't. I didn't let it happen. It just happened. I, I didn't do it. I was just there to sort of write it down. Which which sounds crazy, but if if you're a writer and you sort of and you're in that mode where you're following the story and just sort of seeing where it goes, that's that's how it really feels sometimes. Well, then let me ask you: you you wrote the big series and you went on to what you were calling a tight thriller. Yeah. And so I always and we this we talk about this as some of Boucher kinds of people. Is there another genre inside you? To kill a mockingbird, ready to come out of you? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean. The one standalone, the one big standalone was what was the lock artist. And that was, you know, that was a younger character. And I didn't really think about the fact that I was essentially writing a young adult book. And not just because the character is that age, that that's not all it takes for a book to be a young adult book. It also has to have some themes about coming of age and, you know, the things that any person at that age can sort of relate to. And but it it ended up being kind of a young adult book, and it actually was sort of marketed and sort of had it, it, it won this award from the American Library Association. It's called the Alex Award for a book that crosses over the adult market into the young into the young adult market. So I got to go to the American Library Association, the their big conference down in New Orleans, and for one weekend I was a young adult author. It was just like the coolest thing. Just to be part of that world, for just 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 for a little while, and and to realize that those are the books that I that meant so much to me at that age. Even though you know we didn't call them young adult books back then, because that market didn't really you know they didn't have that market that they called it that. But we all know what that means. It's those books that you read when you're a teenager that just mean so much to you. If if I go somewhere else, I think that's where I would go. I would go back to that and write something for for a younger audience. Do things like the awards uh, have an effect on how you write, like, you know, Edgar Awards and stuff, if you win something like that? I honestly don't think so. I mean, it's easy to say it. I mean, and I've been very fortunate with that, with a couple of Edgars and a, and a Steel Dagger, you know, for Best Thriller. And I mean, I mean, they're great. And it's fun. And, it's, and it really makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you're doing the right thing and that you're in the right place. But I, I'm really not conscious of that when I'm starting something new. I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know write the next book and try to make it as as good a book as I can, which sounds kind of like a dumb cliche, but I don't, I don't think it's really had that much of a, uh, that uh, has had a big effect on what I've done. I don't think I, it hasn't been conscious. It certainly hasn't been, okay, I wrote, I, I, I won an award for this kind of thing. So I better do it again, you know, cause that's what they want. 
or that's what's going to get me another award or something like that. That would be a really bad way to think, I think. Yeah, 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 I think so too. Well, so are you are you focused on reviews then or how people act or react and stuff like that? Whenever I hang around young writers and they start talking about reviews, the, I always tell them if, it, if at all possible, the, the, the perfect wor- in a perfect world, you would never read a review ever, which I realize is not practical because reviews are they're important for, for marketing and they end up going on your book and, and you sort of can't avoid them. I mean, I just don't understand what, what a good review or a bad review, how it's going to help you, honestly. And certainly a bad review could, I think, could, could really hurt you and really discourage you, you know. So I think in a perfect world, you, you just wouldn't even think about them. Well, this was my panel at, at BoucherCon, exactly. Oh, yeah? Well, and a good review. And, and, and everybody said, oh, don't read the reviews, but you can't help it, and, you know, that sort of stuff. But, but it goes back to your last answer, which is if you feel you've written the best book you possibly can, your book, right. your story, reviews are are – Nothing. You know you've done the best you possibly can. Yes, you're going to look at them. You can't help. You're a human. But yeah. the, the impact on you should be, hey, I did the best I could. Yeah, that's that's how it should be. And 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 what you just said is really important. It's like it's like you should know whether you wrote your best book or not. You know, if it's it's like that was that was that was one thing that that, that Lee Child always used to say that I was I always respected so much is that he knew when he wrote a really good. Jack Reacher book. And he was honest to say that some of them weren't the best Jack Reacher book. And he knew it. But when he wrote a really good one, he knew it. And it didn't matter what anybody else said. He just knew it. And and that's all that mattered to him. Right. I think it's important, you know. Yeah. Um okay. So no and speaking of that, do you do you have social media set up? Do you have a website? Yeah, yeah, I got all that. Let's let's give it out. You sort of have to. I mean, it's my the website is authorstevehamilton.com, and I'm uh, author Steve on Twitter, whatever it is now X, sorry, formerly known as Twitter, and author Steve Hamilton, I believe, on Facebook. Well, that's fantastic. Now we're going to have your new book up. We'll have your website, all your social media on ours, so people could find you easily. And the new book is called An Arnable Assassin. Steve Hamilton, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks. This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.